Okay, so thank you very much for joining us today. This is our first virtual salon on the theme of planned giving. Uh, I know I, of course, wherever you may be, I don't know, but uh, I'm speaking to you from my office in the Faculty of Law on the traditional territory of the Ganyagahaga people. Uh, and the island of Montreal has historically been a meeting place for other Indigenous nations, including the Algonquin people. Uh, so I'm Robert Leckie, the Dean of Law, and I'm really delighted to be moderating a, a discussion exploring legacy gifts and how they can support areas that are most meaningful to you. We have a distinguished panel uh, with three members of our McGill Law alumni community, and we'll hear from each one during our time today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce them. Uh, Kathy Nakashima, BSC 77, BCL and LLB 81, is a member of the Faculty of Law's Advisory Board, and she's the faculty's planned giving ambassador. Uh, and Kathy is active in a range of philanthropic endeavors. Uh, Kip Cobbett, BA 69, BCL 72, is the chair emeritus of McGill's Board of Governors, among other things. Kip has uh, had an extraordinary record of volunteer commitment to the university. And Lindsay Hollinger, BCL LLB 08, is a senior portfolio manager of private wealth at Jaroslawski Fraser. And she has an LLM in taxation from École de Haute Etude Commerciale, and she's a chartered investment manager. So with that, welcome to all, uh, and let's get started. We're gonna kick off with Kathy. Uh, as the planned giving ambassador for the Faculty of Law, uh, can you tell us what drew you to that role for us? Why, why is planned giving important to you? First and foremost, I consider myself to be made by McGill, having spent nine years here. <laughs> going to date myself because I am going to admit to having been part of the very last McGill SAGEP cohort, meaning that I graduated in 1974 with a deck in science. So technically I have four McGill degrees. So you can tell that I really enjoy my time here. <laughs> um, I have been very fortunate in my life. And so I always feel that it's important to give back. I sit on the board of a number of not-for-profit organizations and each one of them is special and has an important mission. And my reason for believing strongly in McGill is due to the power of an excellent education. And I think that McGill plays such a key role in Montreal and in Quebec as a whole. I've been active with McGill Law in particular because my years there were absolutely wonderful. And my law degrees, I consider passports to very nice jobs, both in private practice and then um, in-house with a top three Canadian conglomerate. And both jobs, I feel, uh, owe a lot to my great education that I had at McGill. I continue to use my knowledge and analytical skills that I got from McGill uh, on a daily basis, really, uh, including as chair of the board of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and also as chair of the governance committee of UNICEF Canada. I like plan giving because it is a way to leave a legacy after you're gone. It's an expression of gratitude and thanks and I think it shows you're thinking about the future of McGill, the institution, its professors and its students. And to me, it is really important that McGill remain excellent like it is today. Um, I put myself through school and I was lucky to benefit from the plan giving of people who went before me. And that includes the James McGill, McConnell, Wainwright and University Scholarships uh, and the Dow Hickson and Caron Prizes. Um, all of those made it possible for me to do my studies on a full-time basis without having to work part-time during the school year. So I was so grateful for that. Uh, and I would like to give back in some way like that. Uh, I became the law plan giving ambassador during the 200 for 200 campaign last year. Uh, and I felt it was a meaningful way for me to celebrate McGill's 200th. 
while doing something that I thought was meaningful. So that's in a nutshell is how it came to be, Robert. Thanks so much. And you make it very concrete, referring to how you yourself benefited from the gifts that other people oh, had, uh, had planned and executed. Definitely. Uh, Grâce à votre relation avec la faculté, je sais que vous êtes une grande partisan des dons planifiés à l'université. Alors, pourriez-vous nous expliquer un petit peu pourquoi cela vous tient tant à cœur et pourquoi vous choisissez de l'utiliser comme un véhicule pour uh, vos fins philanthropiques? Merci, Robert, avec plaisir. Uh, D'après moi, je crois que les dons planifiés sont particulièrement appropriés pour les avocats qui exercent leur, leur profession dans la pratique privée comme moi, moi je l'ai fait pendant la majeure partie de ma carrière. C'est vrai que les avocats peuvent toujours peuvent toucher un bon revenu, même un très bon revenu, mais le fait de, demeure que c'est du revenu et c'est lourdement imposable. Ça veut dire qu'after tax, il ne reste pas grand-chose. Les, 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 les avocats en pratique privée, nous n'avons pas accès aux stock options, alors Normalement, c'est assez difficile pour nous d'accumuler des vrais uh, savings, d'épargner beaucoup. And I would also say that generally, most lawyers are conservative by nature. So the money that we do succeed in saving, we want to keep, frankly, and, and when we have to live off that money in our retirement because most of us don't benefit from any employer-sponsored pension funds. So you put those two things together, it is difficult for lawyers who've been in private practice to make a substantial gift to McGill or any other institution during their lifetimes, because we want to make sure that we are looked after and our families are looked after to the greatest possible extent. Having said that, of course, once death occurs, then in a sense, um, we, we, in a very real sense, we don't have to worry about our living expenses. So it's easier for us to, to, to give away some of the uh, assets that we may have accumulated. So I really think for people who live off income the way lawyers do, that plan giving is a wonderful, wonderful vehicle to benefit institutions in which we have a strong interest. In a nutshell, Robert, that's it. That's great. So we'll, I'll retain that, that most people's living expenses go down with their death, huh? <laughs> well, most of us, most of us. <laughs> I think even, even, even an a, a, a unschooled financial lawyer can figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and, and turning to you, Lindsay, uh, so tell us some of the different options for estate planning, uh, if one were, were to think about Miguel and the associated financial benefits of the different paths. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It feels lucky to be on this panel because it allows me to think about numerous things that both are my passions and background. I studied philosophy before law, and I sincerely believe that giving back and helping others is a cornerstone to living a meaningful, good life. Um, I love thinking about tax strategy, and now I focus on helping people accumulate and grow their wealth. So smart philanthropy or plan giving is um, one of the great ways that you can achieve all of those, um, and it's what makes it so worthwhile. You can make a larger impact, and like Kip said, at a, at a, at a smaller after-tax cost. And so it's especially great to have an audience of smart, sophisticated alumni of the Faculty of Law to talk to you about it. Um, I'm going to go over four strategies. I'm going to give an overview um, and do not forget that there are great people at McGill, helpful, knowledgeable people to help you figure out the details of these because I'm really just going to gloss over so that you can kind of take tidbits that you get, get excited about and walk away with. So the four things I'm going to go over. First, applies to everyone. You can do it now. You could do it at death. Anytime. If you forget everything I've said, remember just strategy one. Number two, if you're a lawyer who earns a big living personally, so you pay a lot of tax personally, strategy two is for you. Number three, if you accumulate a lot of revenue in your corporation. And number four, if you're in the situation where there's fewer people, maybe in your family, kids that you wanna leave your wealth to, and so you do have the opportunity to give a larger gift, strategy four is for you. So number one, it is always better to donate stocks that have, an, have a gain, an embedded gain than cash. This is because if you donate cash, you get a tax receipt for the full amount of the cash. If you donate stocks, you get a tax receipt for the full amount of the, the value, the fair market value of the stocks. And whereas you would have had to pay tax on the capital gain if you sold the stocks, there is no gain. There is no gain. There is no capital gains tax to pay. 
So you both get the tax receipt and relief of the gain. Number two, if you've earned a lot of money personally, one interesting thing you can do is take out an insurance policy. So the way that it would work is, let's say it's faculty of law at McGill. McGill is the owner of the policy and the beneficiary of the policy. You pay the premiums and it's on your debt. So let's say you took out $500,000 insurance policy for McGill upon, and the premiums are, let's say, I'm giving an example, 30 grand a year for five years that costs $150,000, you're giving McGill 500,000. So that's pretty cool. You're already supersizing your dollars. If though you do have a big tax bill to pay at the end of the year, you might also qualify for mining flow through shares. Now mining flow through shares are an area that the government has created tax incentives for because it's otherwise not that um, advantageous to invest in them because it's rarely profitable. But what you do get are tax benefits. And if you combine mining flow through shares with a donation, you get a double tax benefit. So the way you would use this in this scenario is you would buy mining flow through shares for the value of your premium, the insurance premium, you would donate, you donate those to McGill, McGill pays the premium. And what that ends up costing you is instead of $150,000, it's like 10 cents on the dollar. So it could be $15,000 to give McGill 500,000. That's an area you'd, you'd wanna get more information about mining flow through shares and insurance, but that's really, really cost-effective. Number three, simpler. Many lawyers are incorporated now. If you're a partner at a firm and you earn your, your income right into a corporation, so it might be that you accumulate your wealth in a corporation, maybe you invest through the corporation. If that's the case, a cool thing to do is to get an insurance policy through your corporation. So at death, your corporation would get, if you use the same example, $500,000. And in that case, it is still better to then donate stocks with a gain. So you get the insurance policy, you pay the premiums, you end up getting more for what you've paid, and then you still keep that money still donate marketable securities because you know we're combining the benefits and that's greater. Final thing, um, and I hope I haven't lost too many people, is a charitable remainder trust. And so what you could do with a charitable remainder trust is if you're gonna give a really big gift upon death, um, what happens is you can't benefit from the full tax receipt upon death. And so the better thing to do is to create a charitable remainder trust, which allows you to give that amount during your life you get the tax receipt during your life, you get to use all those tax benefits, and you get to accumulate the benefits or the growth of that income in the charitable remainder trust. So let's say you manage your money with me, you say, Lindsay, I want to give like a huge gift at death, I would recommend you put that, let's say it's a million dollars, into a charitable remainder trust, you would still continue to earn the income on that amount through the trust, and on death, the institution or organization that you've chosen gets the amount you've destined for them, which could be the million, and you didn't lose any of the benefits of those tax receipts during your life. So those are the four. I hope any of them sounded interesting, and please feel free to contact McGill professionals for more information. I love it. So none of, none of that was advice you could take straight to the bank, but it gives us all... <laughs> You know, post-it notes in our mind as we think about this, when we resume a conversation with someone at McGill or a financial professional, we have a better sense of what possibilities to raise. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank and you. so turning from Lindsay's sort of list of the four things, Kathy, which vehicles did you consider when making a planned gift? I kept things simple. So <laughs> my planned gift, like the majority of donors, I believe, um, I made a bequest in a will. I did it in a notarial will, so my heirs could avoid probate. Um, and like Lindsay suggested, most of the bequest was by way of appreciated publicly traded shares. I've been horrible keeping track of my adjusted cost base of my non-RSP shares. I have bank shares with dividend reinvestment, all kinds of things. I love the fact that I don't really keep track of it. I know I'm going to donate them all without having to worry about capital gains tax and, and it'll be at a lower cost. And I find that very attractive. Um, I would like to add that in terms of my current giving, I have used flow through shares and I found that to be an excellent way to have relatively low after tax costs to my donations. So those are the two main vehicles I've used. Thanks so much. And, and Kip, when did you decide the time was right for
for estate planning or uh, thinking about plan plan giving? Kip, we got there you yeah, go. Yeah, there we go. I think everybody on this call should be very pleased to hear that what really made me think of plan giving was when somebody at McGill talked about plan giving. <laughs> and it was it was something that I'd had in the back of my mind for some time, but like many of us, I think I'm pretty good at putting things off to, to tomorrow if they don't really have to be done today. But when I heard the talk about plan giving around the campaign cabinet table as we were planning this current campaign, I thought, well, there's no time like the present. I'm not getting any younger. So I, I, I amended my will to provide for a bequest to McGill. It was as simple as that. And it was a plain vanilla, no, no bells or whistles, just X goes to McGill. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. What about the timing for you? You're you're on mute as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, um, I think it's true that the cobbler's children wears no shoes, and people might <laughs> expect lawyers who are half sophisticated to do extensive estate planning. But I have to admit that I was feeling pretty invincible when I was young and I graduated. And I also thought I was much too busy to turn my mind to something complicated. So I am embarrassed to say that I just jotted down a basic hologram will. Uh, and uh, I live with that holograph will, I should say. And I live with that until my older son was born. And then I started to think I had to provide for him and for others I care about. And I also realized that I wanted my estate to be handled in a tax efficient way. So it was uh, really towards my mid forties that I really got into estate planning. And since then I have tried to stay up to date. I think they advise you if you go through big life changes that you should be looking at your will if not doing it on just a regular every five year basis or something like that. So I was a slow starter, but I think I've caught up. <laughs> I'm sure you have, thank you. And Lindsay, in tant que professionnel de la finance, quel serait d'après vous le moment idéal ou le bon moment pour commencer la planification successorale? En fait, euh, je pense que ce que Cathy vient de dire euh, est pas mal correct. Ça dépend de l'individu et les circonstances, mais en général, dès que quelqu'un a des liquidités, des investissements plus importants, euh, ça serait le moment de commencer à penser à comment les structurer. Et sûrement, quand il y a des enfants dans l'image, dans euh, c'est souvent quand on pense à comment, comment euh, choisir les montants qu'ils vont avoir, à quel âge. Euh, si, si c'était nécessaire de vous donner un âge, je dirais plutôt dans les cinquantaines, alors Cathy était tôt, finalement. Euh, parce que normalement, dans les cinquantaines, je dirais 55 jusqu'à 60, 65, on est un peu plus établi, on a un plus gros portefeuille, on a des actifs. Et là, il y a plus de l'opportunité de pouvoir penser à comment... Euh, structurer nos affaires et pouvoir faire quelque chose de, de plus important. Donc, Cathy, vous étiez précoce. Alors... Oh, <laughs> et je ne savais pas. <laughs> Tell us, Cathy, I mean, so, as the Planned Giving Ambassador for the faculty, I know you've reached out and had conversations with a number of people. Can you tell us about a response or two you've had when reaching out to initiate that conversation? Yes, I found it very interesting. I wanted to learn about their stories and their motivation. And to my pleasant surprise, um, everyone I reached out to was eager to share that with me. And that's a tribute to McGill because they all say they're so grateful to McGill that they want to share anything that could be helpful in ha uh, helping McGill attract new plan givers. So I will mention one lawyer who is in Paris who is extremely grateful for his great education um, at McGill. He feels that his reputation in Europe is right up there with Harvard and Oxford. So he feels very proud of it. Um, one way he gave back was, I guess he did it virtually, but uh, he was on the faculty, law faculty advisory board for a while. 
And another way he was giving back is by creating an endowment that funds comparative law. So he's doing that now, but he mentioned to me that his planned gift is a bequest in the will that will be used to fund that endowment. So you can see that uh, it wasn't enough to do it just during his lifetime. He wants to make sure that uh, it's secure later on. Uh, another lawyer I spoke to also outside of Montreal in New York is a graduate of um, and was a faculty lecturer at the Institute of Air and Space Law. He too is extremely appreciative of his McGill education and he wants to support quality teaching and the continuity of the Institute. So his planned gift is by way of a life insurance policy that will provide benefits on his death to create a chair in space law at the Institute. And he's thought it out so carefully that his will also provides that, uh, you know, if the requirements for a chair become greater by the time of his death, his will uh, has a bequest that will fund the shortfall from the insurance policy. So I thought that was a lot of very careful planning. And all in all, um, although the vehicles might be different, I have to say that these people, you know, they do it out of a love for McGill and of wanting to make sure that McGill remains excellent. Thank you. That's, I, I mean, I'm actually quite moved by the, the, the detail of the one donor who contemplated even a sort of shortfall potentially in oh, the yeah. will and, and, and covered it up. Yeah. I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna see if, if anyone on the call has, questions, but just uh, I'll add one more thing. Lindsay had gone through a little list of options and Kathy hinted a moment ago that uh, some donors may do something in their lifetime and then back it up with a kind of capital gift that would endow the initiative after their death. I know sometimes people come at it the other way. They have the idea that in their estate, they're going to make a, a planned gift. They want to endow something that will go on in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if the circumstances allow, we'll suggest that they make it what we would call a hybrid where they might pay the, the, the costs uh, on a sort of annual basis, what we call direct spending or di direct funding to allow themselves to start the initiative while they're still alive, rather than waiting until it's fully backstopped by capital out of their estate. And that can allow mm -hmm. people in a kind of satisfying way to sort of see the impact while they're around come and meet the students, come and meet the professors, see the program. Uh, and that can be a way that you can do something in perpetuity with your will and make it happen year over year in your lifetime. So there's a, a number of things that we can talk to people about. Um, and I would just add, Dean Leckie, I would add that the flow through shares like Kathy had mentioned and the donating shares at a gain, those are just easily done during one's lifetime in addition to thinking about them in your will. and. Truthfully, I mean, we all want our investments to grow. We want our portfolio to grow to potentially live to our estate or elsewhere. But if you're thinking about growing your portfolio and you have cash that you would otherwise donate, it's a very easy switch to donate the stocks with the gain and replenish, continually replenish your portfolio so it continues to grow effectively. It's much more efficient that way, so. That's a great point. Yeah, you're not just diminishing your capital, it's possible no. to, to replenish it with further cash. That's great. Let's see if anyone uh, having tuned in has any questions for our panelists. I guess one question I have, Neil here, I, I guess on the insurance side, given the kind of, is there any advantage to doing it earlier in life, you know, when you're healthier and younger in terms of getting more bang for your buck on the insurance policy? I'm assuming the answer is yes, but I just wanted to confirm that. Yes. Yes, that's definitely, that is definitely the case. The earlier, the less expensive. Um, the earlier, the less expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's never too late, but uh, sooner is better than later. Yes. Anything else from, uh, from anyone with us? Robert, I'd just like to add something if I could. Of course. Lindsay quite correctly said the right time to really think about estate planning is perhaps in your 50s when you have have more assets than you would have had in your 20s and 30s. But let me underline that it is one should always have a will. 
an estate plan, when, when we talk about estate planning, we're normally talking about financial engineering of, in some shape or form. But you, you've got to have a will. I unfortunately had a family member and several good friends who died prematurely without wills, and it's just a nightmare. So it, my, my, my view is anybody over the age of 18 should have a will, no matter how simple it is. That's it. Thank you. And the point, I think Kathy mentioned it, that you can always change your will or that, you know, review it every three or five years or something like that is also an important one. I was having a conversation with a relative who's about 80, in good health, still in her own house. And she was wondering how much she should put in her will for charity. And she's sort of saying, oh, well, I don't know. I might have expensive residential care costs still to come. And I said to her, well, you know, think of your will, think of the will you have now as the way your estate will be distributed if you died in your sleep tonight. Um, you know, if you move into a, an expensive residential care institution, you can change your will if it turns out you've committed more to charity than you would like. But, you know, at the moment, if you die today with a lot of appreciated stocks and your home and so on, you might wish that you had given more. And, you know, your heirs will not be able to make a donation out of your estate to get those tax advantages. You've got to do that yourself. So the idea that one can make the will that's right for now or the next several years and always change it in the future, I think is, is helpful to keep in mind. I think that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, in a very real sense, it's odd to say it, but a will is a living document and it should be reviewed regularly. And I think you can also provide percentages. Like, yes. you know, if you're worried about an amount not being the right amount, but you want to give 10% of your estate, for example, to McGill. And to Neil's point, it, it, and timing, it, it, it is difficult to sometimes figure out you want to get the insurance policy when you're young, but you might not have the liquidity you know, available for the mining flow through shares right away or to pay the premium of, of like a whole life or universal policy. So um, it is finding that right timing that's there for you. And perhaps, as we're all saying, you can amend it and find different opportunities as you go along. Well, listen, a big thank you to our panelists, Kathy Nakashima, Kip Cobbett, and Lindsay Hollinger. Uh, it's been a really informative and, and inspiring panel today, hearing about some of the possibilities and some of the motivations that have led you and others to, to consider McGill and other institutions they care about in their planning. So thank you very much for being with us uh, and for your ongoing support of the McGill Faculty of Law. We look forward to seeing you again in Chancellor Day Hall or elsewhere before very long. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.